countries around the world, including in China, where innovation is a key part of the country's future. And I think there are two important elements why I see innovation as being very important for a country's future. So one is clearly the economic value creation side. We all know innovation helps create new businesses, creates new economic value, creates wealth. So there's economic argument out there. But I think innovation also has a very important element of social value creation, which is linked to jobs, linked to allowing people to get the best and express the best of themselves. If you link innovation to entrepreneurship, it's a whole sort of theme of allowing young people to express themselves through creative ideas. So I think innovation has a very important position in the strategic agenda of many countries, many regions, simply because of this economic and the social dimension that it actually encompasses. Now, India has often been termed as an innovative country. Indians are often seen as very innovative. Today, especially in many Western markets, uh, the Indian CEOs and Indian professionals are very successful, leading you know, global technology giants, leading organizations in the financial sector, and so on. And the key question that I would like to pose to the panel today is, how can we really position India from an innovation perspective both internally, so how can we innovate for a local market, which of course has a very strong component of a rural segment in the country, yet at the same time make India an innovation leader in the world, globally, so the world looks upon us as an innovation driver in their own uh, context. So to help us address them, we have uh, five distinguished speakers. And what I'll request them to do is make some very brief remarks at the beginning, so two or three minutes. Uh, we will pick up some informal discussion, Q&A out here on the stage, but I really want to involve you in the discussion. So if you feel you, you know, have a question, please note it down and you can ask it. We'll involve you very quickly. If you feel you have an immediate question that needs a quick answer, uh, please do raise, you know, one hand or both hands and give some signal to me, I'll try and bring you in the discussion even earlier on. So to help start the discussion, uh, on my immediate left, uh, we have Mr. Arun Kumar, who is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of KPMG in India. So Arun, why don't you just help kick off the discussion with your perspective yeah. on this topic? Thank you. Well, first of all, Samad, it's great to be here with you in a very different city. It's good to see you here. Uh, I had a couple of thoughts about the whole topic of this conversation of innovation. One is my view that there's plenty of innovation that's actually happening in India. Uh, innovation motivated by very different needs. Uh, innovation at large scale and small scale. For instance, the Mars mission, mission of ISRO, which is probably the most cost-effective uh, planetary mission that anybody's undertaken, is a great example of innovation. I think Aadhaar and the whole India stack, which everybody knows about, is another great innovation. You've got innovations in payment systems like Beam and Paytm. You see business model innovations like the Bakrangi Mart, which takes kiosks to villages to provide all kinds of services. You've got innovation in microfinance for housing, innovation in microfinance for small retail. Uh, you see urban applications like the Swachta, which, uh, where citizens can exchange information on the city and the situation in the city. And the talk of the Google Toilet Locator, which is in line with the movement towards removing open defecation so that people can find where the nearest public toilet is. In the healthcare area, we see innovations like smartphones attached to lenses to create microphones. You see uh, new delivery systems. So I see a lot of innovation. And, I, and I've come back to India, frankly, after 40 years. And I have to tell you that I'm really excited by the range of innovation that I'm seeing, just total range of innovation. The second thing that excites me is that many of these innovations are driven not necessarily by just financial incentives. There's actually a strong social incentive. And the people who worked on sending the Mars mission were not motivated by financial incentives. They were motivated by something else, pride in their work, pride in their country, pride in their accomplishments. And a lot of the healthcare innovations I see are not motivated by people, uh, you know, really, where the, finan the financial aspects are not their primary motivation. So this is a really interesting aspect. You know, I came from Silicon Valley where people are motivated by different things like technology, etc. Here I find the motivation to be social quite a bit. Now what kinds of policies and institutions are needed to take this to the next level? And I had a few quick thoughts on them. Um, one set is what can the government do, because the government is a big player. Uh, 
the mission mode initiatives of the government has undertaken in the past, like the Aadhaar or ISRO for that matter, or CDOT, have been generally, you know, those are examples of success. You get a, a group of bright people, give them the resources, and let them go for it. The second, I think, the government itself is a very large market. If it's the railways or the very big departments, and how can they be used to spur innovation among small industries? Because in India, to create the kind of employment that's needed here, one has to see an explosion of small and medium enterprises. You've got to see innovation coming from SMEs. SMEs really are the job creators. And so there are some programs that I was familiar with in the US that worked. One was called the Small Business Innovation Research Grant, where competitively the government would give grants supported by the government departments to create innovations for some department. You know, it could be the Department of Defense. It could be the Department of Transportation. So some program like that could be useful to get a more small enterprise innovating. Another is making it easier for small enterprises to sell innovative new products to the government. Typically, when you want to sell to the government, you've got to have products that have been in existence for a long time. The firm has had to be in existence for a long time. How do you cut through all that? So the Department of Defense in the US recently set up a unit called DXIUX, which was focused on that to get new entrepreneurs to sell their products quickly, um, you know, giving, giving them some special authorities to sell directly to the government. So I think the government has one set. The second really, it's public-private participation, you know, multi-stakeholder situations like creating technology parks. There's a good example of the FinTech Valley that's coming up in Vizag that you may want to talk about. Uh, so I think getting stakeholders, regulators, state governments, central governments, and multiple companies together is another model. I've seen it work very nicely in Saudi Arabia, for example, where focus on oil exploration as the, the Dharan Technology Park was set up along with the university. So that's another example that um, it's a really public-private model. And finally, just getting data out to entrepreneurs, you know, cluster mapping schemes where you get information on the resources in the region so that we can promote more regional uh, business development. So, Arun, I'm going to put in the spot a little bit. So you said you spent a large part of the last 40 years outside the US, right? Outside India, so you've been in the US largely. So now coming back to India after a fairly long period, even though you've been in and out. Yeah. What kind of a score would you give India on innovation, having succeeded in achieving innovation potential on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest? Well, depending on what you're comparing with, uh, certainly in the region and in my previous role, I had a fair amount of exposure to markets around the world. Certainly in, in the whole South Asia region and Southeast Asia region, I would put India at probably number one. Uh, if, you, if you look at India and, say, the U.S., uh, venture capital friends of mine, investor friends of mine have told me that they find that the investment environment in Bangalore or in Gurgaon to be just as exciting as any place in the U.S. except Silicon Valley. And I think our colleague from General Atlantic might have some comments on that. Uh, so I've heard you know, good comments about the opportunities here. Uh, so I would say that, you know, as I said before, that I find it uh, pretty exciting even on a global scale. Okay. And I find people coming back to India now to look at starting companies. But you haven't given a number. A number. It's okay, I don't want to push you if you don't want to give But you know, the Global so. Innovation Index, I think, ranked in India, 60. ranked like six points or something on the global. 60 on the to 60. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Nicholas, so I come to you next. And uh, you've had the unique sort of benefit of having spent time in India, in fact. Uh, and so, and you're also in working and associated with technologies at leading edge right now, FinTech blockchain. So, can you, what's your perspective on what's happening in India vis a vis innovation? Yeah, thank you. Um, so my name is Nicholas Carey. I'm the co-founder and president of a firm called Blockchain, which frequently gets confused with a really exciting technology that a lot of people are talking about. Um, but we run the world's largest digital assets platform. So we build software that makes it possible for people to send, receive, and secure new digital assets, things like Bitcoin and Ethereum and a lot of new ones that are coming forward. Um, I actually started my career 10 years ago uh, here in India, um, but I was a teacher. I taught uh, basic computer science and creative writing outside of Bengaluru in a small village. And uh, I was there for the first time in 10 years, um, just a few days ago. And I was driving all my team crazy because I was telling them about how everything is completely different and how things have changed. And uh, I think they got a little sick and tired of hearing about it. Um, so my, my vantage point is uh, one where I have traveled around the world significantly uh, over the past 10 years building technology startups. And um, I, I hope that I will be able to share a little bit about what I've learned 
in terms of what I see be successful um, in terms of creating the environment that inspires entrepreneurs to take risks and uh, supporting those entrepreneurs as they go through that journey. So I have professional experience trying to reinvent the financial system to build an open, fair, and accessible financial future for everyone, and that's what I do in my professional life. I also founded a nonprofit called skiesthelimit.org. We're the world's first AI-powered NGO, and what we do is match entrepreneurs with subject matter experts uh, that have key capabilities to help entrepreneurs along their journeys. And we're not trying to find the next Google or the next uh, Flipkart or something like that. Our entrepreneurs come to us from severely underrepresented backgrounds. And it's my firm belief that if we give people confidence, we can help at least give them and get them started on the right track to potentially building sustainable businesses. And uh, it's not something we should be afraid of. Most of the huge uh, programs over the past few decades coming out of large corporate CSR programs have all been about workforce uh, development, which is really just about making maybe employees a little bit more uh, efficient or something like that. But what's happening in the world today is that we have a confluence of things that are going to cause um, some significant issues for employment. You've got automation, which will end up wrecking low-income jobs. And uh, you also have large companies that are trying to deal with increasing cost bases, and they're probably going to slash jobs. So we have a real issue because there are going to be a lot of people that are coming into the workforce. Um, they're going to have fewer opportunities for economic mobility. So I really, truly believe that entrepreneurship uh, is the answer to that. Most new jobs are created by newly created businesses. It's not the old companies that create new jobs. So um, we need to create environments that inspire people to build businesses at all different levels. And so um, I'm really eager to, to learn a little bit from everyone on the stage here that has a lot more domain expertise probably here in India than I do. Um, but I hope to also share a little bit about what I'm seeing. Um, you know, I was in Bengaluru this week for the first time again after a decade. We went to a meetup um, that we hosted uh, to basically talk a little bit more about open uh, technology development and uh, blockchain uh, in general. And it was completely oversubscribed. Um, 500 people had to join the meeting by a Google Hangout because we couldn't fit everybody in the room. And in that room were 80% of the audience were programmers and computer scientists and developers. So for, for the last 20, 30 years, these huge corporations set up these enormous technology parks and have trained hundreds of thousands of people here in India um, in incredibly valuable skills that have helped uh, automate and scale a lot of Western businesses. Um, and so I think once some of that talent um, can be paired with uh, good mentorship and good coaching and eventually capital, um, you can see some really incredible things happen. So in short, uh, I'm very bullish on things in India in general. On our platform, we've seen um, growth uh, outpace other markets here over the past year, which is why we just signed an agreement with uh, an Indian-based um, to start up uh, called UnoCoin down in, in Bangalore. And uh, we're going to be spending a lot more time here, and I'm excited to kind of be coming back home. So, uh, yeah. Nicholas, so uh, it's very nice of you to, in fact, call Termit come, coming back home. I think that's uh, you know, very nice to hear that. Uh, you also spent time in India, you know, working uh, with people really in the, you know, let's say, outside the city area. And I was interested in your perspective being you know, at least a non-Indian by birth, you know, what's your perspective on the culture that you saw, that you see in India? I mean, how is that culture, you know, adaptable towards entrepreneurship? Do you feel that the Indian culture is supportive of that, or what's your sense of that? Um, that's a great question. Uh, and I, I see this in a lot of places around the world where family members, um, they, they kind of tell you, you have to be a doctor or an engineer, and that's something you, you hear in a lot of different emerging markets, and it's been a and I think it's kind of a shame because uh, that does sort of put an enormous amount of pressure in, in, on entrepreneurs and limits creativity, and uh, especially when it comes to um, the way people explore educational opportunities. If, if they're getting uh, tracked very young to only pursue two things, um, that kind of pressure I think isn't very good. So um, I think a transformation does need to sort of uh, occur to a certain extent um, around taking risks, uh, and that, that's not an easy thing to do. Um, I would welcome you know, feedback from the other me members of the panel around how to, to trigger some of that. I do think uh, it's definitely possible. Um, I see people finding innovative ways to do all kinds of interesting things here. Um, so I think letting them know that that's okay <laughs> is probably one thing that's probably helpful. And then building a, a regulatory regime for small business development, um, like Arjun suggested, is a really good idea. 
uh, letting them know that they have support and sponsorship and maybe a little bit of protection while their nascent business is getting formed so that we can get more of those businesses started could be a good place to go. Um, but on the cultural side, I'm not sure I have actually enough context to really comment on it. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for your insights. Uh, our next speaker is Anu Acharya, who is a founder and chief executive officer of Map My Genome. Anu. So, um, I've been an entrepreneur for 17 years and mostly in an industry which uh, is you know, innovative, new, and cutting edge, right? So we do the same things that you would do in the West. But one of the things, at least from my perspective, when you look at India as a place to do, um, you know, get innovative ideas across, I mean, get certain uh, products out, I think there are two, three elements that we have right. And I think the first element we have right is we have a lot of chaos, which, which is a, a sign of opportunity. Uh, we do have a lot of diversity in terms of the kinds of people that we have, both in terms of genetic makeup, but also in terms of uh, thought op uh, opinions and thoughts. And I think putting those together is, is a starting point of uh, where you can get innovation. We, we do see that um, the challenge really is for us, and especially I've gone through this journey twice now, uh, is that we do see that there are certain challenges for the, for an Indian entrepreneur and for Indian innovators. And I think the primarily those would be uh, the lack of trust between uh, academia and, and industry. So there are good sets of uh, people within the academic uh, environments. There are good people in, in industry. But a lot of times, we don't necessarily work with each other. So one is that challenge that we need to sort out. The other uh, clearly is that you know, we, um, you know, as you go through this path and you build a product, and a lot of people have built some really good products, the challenge for an entrepreneur or for an innovator will always be to uh, get it either out of the tech transfer system if they are in academia, or to be able to get out to a commercialization because of the uh, regulatory issues or the power that a, a small officer might have in order just to run the company. So I think those would be the two main things. The other thing, obviously, is uh, that when you're doing something innovative, other than the attitude and uh, the aptitude that is there, I think in a lot of times, you do need people with domain expertise. And in genomics, for instance, a lot of times, we would have to import a lot of talent. So I think the way I look at it, it's not that we don't have the ability to do it. I think the challenge really is to say we have a lot of right ingredients. But I think we need to do a lot more, whether it is in terms of building an ecosystem that uh, allows for um, a better um, an interaction between academia, a better interaction with larger corporations that can actually either absorb these smaller innovations into the system and make sure that you know, there is um, a risk appetite uh, from a funding perspective, because that does need a lot more time than it would need to, let's say, start an e-commerce company. So I think that is where I would say that, um, you know, but you know, given that we are living in a global world, we have access to a lot of global content. There, is, there are people that are constantly moving. Uh, I don't think that it is uh, difficult to, it's impossible to build a great ecosystem. I think you know, the pieces are there, uh, but they're not yet connected. So Anu, I think you've raised certainly the very important issue of ecosystems of innovation. A lot of people talk about the value and importance of ecosystems. And you talked also about the links between universities and companies and the government role out there. And I'd love to probe that a little bit further with you, but I would like to maybe ask you a different question. You're the only female on this panel. And I'd love to ask you the question, how's life been for you as a female entrepreneur? Has it been easier? Has it been difficult? What do you see about other, you being a role model for other women uh, to take on this role? <clears throat> so I, I went to IIT Kharagpur. We were 10 out of 400. We were used to this from a long time back. <laughs> and, uh, so I think one was that you know we were not considered to be you know we, uh, my my parents didn't raise me up to feel that I was a woman. I mean I was a girl child. We were three girls and one boy in our in our family. Uh, but you know personally I don't think that uh, it has been very diff it has been different for me or uh, or uh, I mean or a male entrepreneur, I think the industry I'm in is, is a tougher one. It does uh, make certain, there are certain biases which are inbuilt in a lot of people. And I think you know, what I've done is to understand those biases uh, and not necessarily say that you know, it is a problem and all. I think it's, uh, what one needs to understand is to make sure that we understand um, the biases that exist in our, in our system, in our ecosystem, whether it is in women or girls or boys. And, and to be able to be gently change those biases. 
right? And I think that's what, uh, at least, you know, growing up, and I see a lot of young women who come to me for advice. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing I tell them that you know, it's not good to just say that, you know, I and I usually tell them that you know, if you invite me because. I'm a female entrepreneur. I usually say, no, just call me an entrepreneur and I'll come, otherwise I won't come. So I think there are some small changes that I like to bring in. And hopefully by the time my daughters uh, become old enough, uh, they don't have to fight this battle. OK, thank you. I'm sure this issue is something that some members in the audience might want to explore further. But thank you for your perspective on that. Uh, the next speaker is Sandeep Nayak, who is a managed director of General Atlantic in India. Sandeep? Uh, just in terms of background, I used to be a medical device inventor in the U.S., having started a med device company, and now I'm an investor in India, back home in India. And so I have a, two different perspectives about innovation that I've seen in the West and what I see in India. And I may be a bit of an outlier on the stage where I don't think, uh, I think we are far away from being an innovation center in India, and I'll tell you the reasons why. Uh, if you think about just defining innovation, innovation is just doing things differently in a process that makes the earlier process either irrelevant or inefficient. If you take that definition of innovation, uh, I believe that in India we have shown sparks of innovation, but we've really not gotten to the, to the roots of innovation. And Arun mentioned some of the innovations that we have done in India, including the ISRO space mission to Mars. Uh, on the healthcare side, we have taken mass production techniques and applied it to a very specialized skill like surgery. And you've seen that in the Arvindai Institute. You've seen that at Shankar Netrale, at Narayan Rudrale, to bring mass production techniques to surgery to provide really affordable, accessible healthcare at very, very low cost. That, to me, is also an innovation. On the education front, there is an organization called Ekal Vidyale, which could start and run a school in rural villages for a dollar a day. That's 67 rupees a day. They can run a school. And that's by training a local villager who's typically a woman to really provide functional application job-based education and rural entrepreneurship, which can make those people employable. Because one of the biggest issues we have is we have tons of graduates coming out of India, but on day one, they are unemployable because they just don't have real skills. So innovation has happened in spurts, and there are sparks of innovation. I have two fantastic entrepreneurs sitting around me. I have some in the audience here who have really taken that risk appetite and, and built some real companies. Dheeraj here uh, runs one of the largest big data analytics company. And as General Atlantic, they invested behind Dheeraj when much ahead of big data being sexy. And we today have a world-class institution coming out of India. But having said that, the question is, is India an innovation hub? It's a layered question. There's no simple answer. But if you look at just a sheer R&D spend as a percent of GDP, we had 0.8% of GDP goes back into R&D, are we really going to solve real problems? I don't think so. If you think of the number of pat patents coming out of India, compared to any of our peer country, we are far, far, far behind. This whole concept and idea of Jugad innovation that we celebrate as an Indian invention, in my limited view, is flawed. Because Jugad just means, how do you just get a thing done without having to really solve the inherent problem? that actually originates that particular issue. And we have some serious issues in India which need surgical intervention, and we are solving them using Band-Aid solutions. So for me, Jugad innovation at the end of the day becomes Band-Aid innovation, and that really doesn't take away the actual issues or the reasons behind those issues. So are we there? Can we be the innovation center? There's always potential, and, and India as a country always had the potential across many things. There's always this hope of India, but are we delivering on it? I think we are far, far away from it. So, you know, you've taken one of my pet sort of peeves about India's brand and innovation, and that is about how, in fact, sometimes we find officially government also projecting this, you know, frugal innovation and jugad, which I really agree with you. I don't think is the right image for creating an innovation leader globally. I think you can learn from some other techniques in Jugaad, but that's not the image you necessarily want to portray. So how do you actually change the image? How do you change the brand of India? What would you suggest on that front? You know, I believe in frugal innovation. I believe in constraint-based innovation because we just don't have the, the dollars mm -hmm. or the consumer just doesn't have the capability to pay for it. But Jugaad as a term and trying to just find a quick fix is what I take a little bit of offense from. So I, I don't believe in, in coining the term as Jugaad innovation, but frugal innovation matters. <coughs> 
Having said that, Sumitra, you know, even, uh, you know, we celebrate the GE handheld ECG mm -hmm. as a frugal innovation that was supposed to change everything related to cardiac care in India. I was talking to an entrepreneur recently who said it's so difficult to get general practitioners to adopt to that handheld ECG because the general practitioner is more worried about the referral cuts he or she gets when they transfer the patients on to five different cardiac cardiologists and make their cuts and doing that ECG at his or her clinic is just not profitable. And so unless incentives are aligned, no matter what your innovation is, it just will not penetrate and it won't have the, the impact that you would want to have. So there's a whole different level of innovation that needs to happen in India and that's thought innovation. How do you change the way people think to really then allow some of this constraint-based frugal innovation to, to, to make an impact on the masses? Very good. I think that's a topic which we again may chalk up for further exploration, but thank you so much. And thank you, Dheeraj, for waiting so patiently. Uh, so last but not least, we have Dheeraj Rajaram, who's a founder and chief executive officer of Mu Sigma. So I'm going to disappoint you, Sandeep. Uh, I'm going to agree with you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't think you're going to be an outlier here. Innovation, yeah. So uh, I, um, I tend to agree with Sandeep. Um, that uh, if you were to give Israel maybe 9 out of 10 or maybe even 10 out of 10 because we have to give somebody 10 out of 10, uh, I would give Silicon Valley and US, Silicon Valley maybe 7 or 8 out of 10, I would give US overall maybe 6 out of 10, I would give India like 1 or 2 out of 10. We are a society uh, which, are a, which is more a taker society, we are not a giver society. Uh, we don't want to give too much. Innovation happens when interactions happen. More and more interactions happen, that's when innovation will happen. We, we are a society which is getting excited more about entities rather than interactions. So till uh, you know, India becomes a giver society, it's going, to be, uh, it's going to be not a zero to one player, it's going to be a one to n player which is that it'll scale things, it'll do things. I mean, you see all the companies that are getting started here, they are a control C, control V of an American model. You know, most companies are like that. It's not truly, truly, you know, zero to one thinking, original thinking. Originality is something that uh, is not celebrated as much as it should be. Uh, the second part of it is that we today, uh, We've been brought up as a collect collectivistic social setup, you know, so we want to belong. Uh, innovators, by the very nature, should not want to belong. They, would watch, they should want to stand out. They should want to be outliers. They should want to not belong, be in systems. Uh, we celebrate somebody getting into IIT. We celebrate somebody doing well in class. We celebrate, we celebrate belonging rather than standing out. Uh, if you truly want to be, uh, you know, you, you, you want to have two things going on in the society. You want to be a taker society and you want enough people who are standing out. Because taking really mad, uh, giving really mad, sorry, you want to be a giving society and you want to be, have people who stand out. Because if you, have a, if, you have a, if you have people standing out but nobody is giving each other, then the interactions are not of substance. But if you have, you know, all of the people in similar place and they're giving to each other, then it's like, being in the movie Enter the Dragon where Bruce Lee is fighting his own kind of image. So, uh, so that's where I would put it. And I think um, the, the, it's not a skill set or a tool set uh, of issue anymore. It's a more a mindset issue. And for me that mindset comes very, very young. You know, when you are young, are you encouraging people to think horizontally? Are you encouraging knowledge or are you encouraging learning? If you are encouraging knowledge, then you will encourage how much you know. If you encourage learning, you will encourage how much you don't know. Are you encouraging failure? Uh, a, how are you encouraging failure? Uh, are you having, do you have a growth mindset or do you have a fixed mindset? Uh, how many schools uh, have a growth mindset oriented? There are two schools I know of in India. One is the Valley School, you know, which basically orients people towards a growth mindset. Uh, and both schools are actually J, J, J. Krishnamurti founded. All these other schools, you know, uh, and, and I see my own friends and me also, you know, uh, you know I couldn't convince uh, my wife 
to put my son in the valley school because said, you know that, that's all okay but you know I, I won't put him in the valley school because he has to he has to thrive in the system so we uh, we truly are not uh, innovative and that's a problem um, and it's it's maybe okay accepting that uh, rather than trying to be something that we are not maybe we are not wired for that so what so that's my perspective okay it's very very useful you know to get these different perspectives and i think we'll have a very rich discussion but let me ask you one question you know you yourself have been very successful so how did the spark start in you i i think i was an outsider uh, you know i shared i went to an engineering school i shared the same rank as my wife in that class uh, she from the top and me from the bottom so uh, uh, you know i uh, you know i i enjoy ridiculing systems uh you know and uh, i don't like to belong to systems uh i i i very much identify with arguments uh, israelis are very beautiful at being argumentative uh um you know i i find um you know i i find that uh, you, you know people say something but uh, they say something else when they have a couple of glasses of wine uh i think if if you can say the same thing that you would say with a couple of glasses of wine then you have a higher inclination for innovation that's a good uh, test because if there is a diver- if there is a distance between those two things then it means that you you tend to have uh, you tend to want to say things that are agreeable which is your nature towards being collectivistic individualistic people want to argue because they want to take a point of view which will allow for a difference to happen and that's when innovation can truly truly happen but our culture is not wired for that we want to all join together hold hands and sing and do do kumbaya so that's not going to come with that you are you going to i you, you you may you may not want that also because it's uh, true innovations you know uh, and creativity uh, has to have an orientation towards being okay with being a little unhappy um are we okay with that maybe not okay uh panel members any comments in your mind any thoughts based on whatever you've heard from <coughs> others so before i, I open it up yeah <laughs> we'll give that recommendation to the world economic <laughs> forum next time next time <laughs> with innovation sessions mind but any any other comments from yeah arun what well, a question i have i think very interesting comments here uh you know in in silicon valley where i live for many years one of the nice things was that you could call up people and talk about giving and taking they would be very very generous with their advice um i mean just because they that the culture was of sharing um now so, so i think I, i agree with that point that you got to have an environment where people are willing to share generously but why is it that uh in your view that doesn't happen here because you know silicon valley is also highly competitive people are companies are competing with each other individuals are competing with each other and here too we have a competitive situation we talked about ranks you remember your wife's rank and your rank uh, things uh, which fine but we don't have that much of focus um in in the US people are also so obsessed with ranks i mean it might be broadly interesting place but not Correct. so obsessively Correct. but wh- why is th- that's there's competition and there's sharing I, how I, does that work I, together i think what what happens is uh, in india we don't grow up with an abundance mindset we we don't believe in a non zero sum game it's a zero sum game if you win i lose you know that's how we we think about it i think you shouldn't generalize though i i know but that's that's the that's where things are it is a it is a resource constrained environment they, they we've been we we tell our children that you know we tell them that look you got to be in this rank you got to do this you got to your time is constrained if if you have a differently wired child you know we uh, you know i struggled through that throughout my entire childhood you know i was a differently wired child who was told uh, you know that uh, i don't belong in this system uh, again and again and again it was very difficult for me uh, you know uh, when i was in my 10th standard uh you know to see oh, all my other uh, you know cousins you know and th- that was the that was what i was seeing and i can tell you that uh, I- 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 you know lateral thinking horizontal thinking you know happens when different data points are connected 
Uh, and uh, uh, we also seek efficiency in everything that we do. We have an ROI mindset. Uh, but if you look at if you look at true innovation, the way it happens is that you you are, you, you you kind of you don't have an ROI mindset towards your time in the way you connect different kind of systems and all of those kind of things. So if you are learning subjects, you know biology when you're learning biology, physics when you're learning physics, maths when you're learning maths, you know that that way of studying does not allow you to connect to all those things between biology and physics and you know, you know these things. But and that our exams are not prepared for that. Our exams test people on answers. We should be testing people on asking better questions. True innovators ask better questions. We don't. If I asked a better question in one of my tests, I didn't get a better mark. I can tell you that. I'll just jump onto that. You know, <laughs> I was just uh, having been represented on a couple of school boards and college boards. I've got a very different perspective on how education is being done. And the current way of educating classes where there are certain periods of different subjects was really inst got instituted almost 80 or 100 years ago when you were trying to graduate masses of people who would all at graduation do one job, which was being on the manufacturing floor. And you needed to do it with the same consistency, no matter which school that you graduated from. We are so far away from that, yeah, that I the world that we are living in but we are still conducting those classes in the exact same way where nobody is encouraging kids to ask questions. If you do, you are ridiculed. You are not allowing the education system to produce people that have risk appetite. It is all about going down the beaten, beaten path. And that's because we've always been a resource starved country. And hence, it's just about doing what is the best for you in the minimalistic way for for you to get to a goal or get to a path to live a decent life. And, and that's led to, the, to a great class of society that India has produced where we make fantastic managers, but we create very few true disruptive entrepreneurs. Nicholas, I have to ask you this. Again, being the only sort of non-Indian on the panel, a lot of criticism, perhaps rightly so, of the Indian culture education system. I lived in France for many years. I saw the French system operate very close up. Is the European education system much different? Well, um, I have a French mother, so uh, I can tell you that uh, she was pretty intense <laughs> uh, with me. Um, but uh, I, I think it's interesting, the, the, a lot of conversations come back to this education, and it's really challenging to teach kids to be curious. You know, we, we learn when we're children by playing, and then eventually we're told we're not supposed to play anymore and we need to get serious, <laughs> you know? And it, it's crazy to me because, like, you know, I may be a little bit older now, but sometimes psychologically, like, I want to play. And uh, thinking that way uh, has driven an enormous amount of criticism uh, in my direction throughout my entire career. And uh, I think it's unfortunately kind of true that a lot of entrepreneurs are pretty tortured, um, you know, that we get thrown up and look like heroes, you know, but it, honestly, it's an incredibly lonely journey. And uh, I'm not sure how best to describe it, but... In terms of the learning process, I, I really truly believe you've got to make it possible for children to learn how to learn and have it be lifelong because if we don't have a system that does that, you are just going to condition people. And uh, humans will do that pretty effectively, um, sadly. And you're 100% right. This problem around education, though, is not specifically unique to India. Yeah. I, I truly believe we have similar issues yeah. uh, across the Western world. Most of education was, uh, an, uh, was how Imperial England worked because they were a small country which had to rule the whole world. And because that's how they evolved, what it was was coming up with a set of rules and then having every other place follow those rules. So this scalable education that we followed, which was different from the older educational model, which was actually in India very popular uh, in Nalanda and all of these places, which was learning by doing an apprentice model. I think the world as it is moving from uh, you know, uh, raw materials to products and services to staging experiences, what's happening in that world is that you, you have to, everything is becoming more and more a network. Your hotel company is a network, your taxi company is a network, your financial services company is a network, your terrorist organization also is a network. So 
the very nature of networks is that it's extremely distributed and those networks have interactions built into it. We are still not teaching people the power of interactions, which means that it has to be intersubject, one. And it has to be in teams. We should be allowing copying in classes because you have to let learn to work as teams. Which team is going to win? Because everything we teach them in education is the opposite of how life te teaches them. Life then suddenly starts being, uh, now you have started this new journey called life boss. And that's where the fourth rank from guy from behind suddenly says, hey, this has worked for me better. So you know, I because copying is allowed. OK, let's have Anu talk, and then we'll <laughs> get the questions yeah. here. So. so one, I think that, see, I also went through uh, Kendri Vidyale, you know, the standard schooling things. I think the real challenge comes at home. So if you have, a, if you have parents and your friends and your peers who are OK with you know, reading, we, we used to read everything. It did not matter what the teacher said. So I'm saying we've gone through that process, and today we see that you know, a lot of schools have adopted completely new ways of teaching. They have access to content. So I would say that, you know, we can't keep blaming our schools. We need to make sure that the environment at homes are innovative. We need to make sure that our friends are, are, are you know, encouraging us to do that. And I think that's happening. So I wouldn't be that pessimistic about what's going on in the country today, because I have seen the difference between the education that I got in school versus the education my children are getting at school. And you know, my children are a lot more inquisitive. I mean, they, are, they know a lot more. They have a lot more exposure. They are, they are constantly you know, doing why. And they're not, you know. But we also did that. But we did it because it, of the environment at home. It was the environment that we had that allowed us to do that. But Anu, So I would say stop <laughs> blaming the schools. No, I'm not I blaming mean, the schools. We have but to I can tell innovate, you, and we I, can't I, I, I can tell you one thing. <laughs> Every generation is more unprepared today for you know, it always they come. will be. No, no, but I'm saying something else. <laughs> I'm saying that if you, you know, I run a company which typically hires 21, 22 year olds, right? And what we find is that the rate at which markets are moving and changing, the difference between where the markets are and where the education is, that divide is only increasing. Because it doesn't matter if we are doing a really good job with education, if the directionally, we are not in the right thing, you know, if that spread, the markets are constantly challenging us more than what education is, we are going to, we are going to, you know, not be in this mode where, uh, you know, learning by doing uh, is encouraged as much. I, I, I am actually trying to do something, actually. I am working with, uh, you know, the Niti Ayo to see if we can get an 18-year-old program where people, instead of going to college, uh, can come directly and work in Mu Sigma. And they'll be given a job. Don't go to college. Come and work in Mu Sigma. But while working in Mu Sigma, you learn whatever you want to learn. Because until now, we've been studying to get a job. If you have a job, what would you truly, truly be passionate about studying? Maybe it's philosophy. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's something that you're truly passionate about. I studied engineering. I should never have been an engineer. How many of us are engineers who should never be engineers? Then we go and work for KPMG and McKinsey and BCG <laughs> and all of us. After being engineers. So to right? mediate between two friends, yeah, I have to step in. <laughs> okay, so as, as a moderator think, now, let, let me I just... I think we have defined the problem <laughs> yes. now. We should move on to how do we Let's solve get it. the comments. <laughs> yes, yeah, very active. So just keep your questions short, please. That's my one request. And why Silicon Valley is so close to Napa Valley? <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. In front, uh, the microphone to the, the front, please. So I grew up in Bombay, and I live in Singapore. So this discussion is very interesting. I, I, and there are lots of Indian-born entrepreneurs that have gone to school, at least in Singapore and Asia, that have <clears throat> built really innovative and disruptive ideas. I'm curious if it's not a culture thing, but it's a return on innovation. Because if you look at, it's so much easier, you know, you look at the unicorns and how fast they've grown in Asia versus the US. It took six years for Uber to become a unicorn, much faster for Ola and Grab. So if you're looking at the opportunities, there's so much, there's so much more certainty with respect to market acceptance when it's been tested somewhere else. So why would you fund or build ideas that are fundamentally disruptive other than you want to build ideas that are fundamentally disruptive. 
Okay, so we'll take a few more questions and then we'll collect them together. So, other questions? Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Rakesh. I work with Adelman. I just have a question. I mean, schools and education is one thing. What can people do in the companies to nurture the uh, culture of innovation? Because it doesn't stop with schooling only. Absolutely. We have to have innovation going at work every day. Okay. Other questions? Okay, let's take these two. Who wants to address? I'll, I'll jump on to Carlos's question yeah. first, I think. Carlos himself is an entrepreneur and a very successful one at that. And uh, I believe that uh, to answer your question, Carlos, you know, and to also point to what Dheeraj said earlier, it's two separate things, whether you're innovating and creating disruptive companies or you're just replicating companies. And, and what a lot of the companies you reference, which are a replica of what was successful in the West, and they tried that in India, and the results are TBD. None of them are making money. Yes, their valuations are high because people still are saying the hope of a billion people in India, and someday they'll be profitable. But more and more, you've seen down rounds happening, people losing money, lots of companies shutting down because all they did was control paste of what worked in the West. And that does not work in India because India has its own India-specific needs. And the only companies that will scale and eventually be sustainably profitable are companies that will address those needs. And, and entrepreneurs are taking a lazy approach saying, this worked in the West, so I'm sure it's going to work in India. And we are now finding out that that's not the case. And hence, the true entrepreneurs that will be successful and will scale up will be the ones that will address very specific India needs and come up with India solutions. That's always the case. And that's still to happen in the Internet of Things or in the e-commerce side. That will eventually happen. And those are the companies that will scale, not the ones that just copied the rest of the okay. Just to add one more thing. Can I just... the, the economic value add from a company, is it coming from the entrepreneur or is it coming from the investor? The question should be asked, who's actually building the company? If it's the entrepreneur, then you know, then you have you have an you have a chance of having innovation. If it's the investor money that is building the company, then it's money building money building money, <coughs> right? When money makes money, it's not innovation. When things make money, it's when it is innovation. So I, I uh, you know I just feel that uh, the 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 ecosystem uh, today. Is 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 is, a, is not. I wouldn't blame just the entrepreneurs. I would blame the interaction between the entrepreneurs and the investors, and how things are happening. Uh, uh, you know, which wants you know the flow of money from limited partner to general partner to come entrepreneur. How it's flowing. It is. Uh, we are taking the easy right versus the hard but more right. Just generally, in a path with easy right versus hard but more right, the real difference is when you take the hard but more right. How many people are willing to do that? How many people are willing to stand up to their conviction and say that I will defy my investor and I will say, you know, you, you can do whatever you want, but I'll go, I'm, I'm going to build the company the way I want to build my company. That is going to define, you know. Uh, uh, so innovation. let's get. Yeah, Nicholas. I wanted to reply to the question about building a culture of innovation. Um, and to me, that really starts uh, at the very beginning of when you start recruiting people to join you on your mission. Um, it's not necessarily about having the most credentialed employees possible. It's about having people that are deeply committed to what you're doing. And I, I know that sounds like common sense, but um, you know, we are constantly making sure that our team is training for adaptability. Um, we do that at a policy level within the company. We host hackathons. We have a peer-to-peer -peer bonus system. Um, everyone is involved in recruitment so that we're making sure that we're constantly bringing in people that our own team would want to have working and fighting in the trenches alongside with them. You really fall to the level of your training when you're working to do really difficult things. And if you're trying to build a super high performance company, especially one that I think in the future, the most successful companies will be the ones that can adapt most quickly to changing market conditions, it is all going to be about having optionality and inspiring like decentralized decision making in organizations. We have company wide meetings with everybody every single week so that there's no confusion about what's happening. Hierarchical systems were designed to march giant armies of people that were uneducated into firing lines. That is not going to work in the future of business development. And so I think you, you really need to consider those things when you, you want to train your team for, for the future. Um, so those are some of the things we do at blockchain. I mean, I, I'm so confident in my team because they're so amazing that I think we could put them into many different types of businesses and that they would be exceptional. 
Um, and that's because we, we really want those creative people. We, we have people in my company's office and headquarters, 18 different um, passports in an office of 30 people. Because we're building a global company, we want to think globally, we want a diversity of opinions, so that people are constantly bickering. And that's actually important to us, because when they're doing that, we get the best ideas, but then when we make a decision, everyone stops bickering, and we go. And we don't spend too much time looking in the rearview mirror, because that would be uh, just really, really painful. <laughs> Arun? Yeah, so um, I just want to share some thoughts on innovation at KPMG, which might surprise the hell out of d <laughs> <laughs> Now, in our business, and this really is an example, in our business, our clients' needs are always changing. So what you do today, yesterday somebody might put in an enterprise system, today everybody wants cloud, tomorrow people won't even want that. So things are changing all the time. So you've got to be innovating to serve clients, necessarily. Otherwise, you're out of business. Two, technologies are changing that will disrupt our business. You know, there's artificial intelligence, cognitive science, et cetera, et cetera, which will actually remove a lot of the thinking that people do. Uh, so we need to be conscious of that. So how do we go about promoting innovation? It's something that I'm, I'm really very interested in and love to hear from innovators about this afterwards. But one of the big things I think is important is to have a culture where failure is tolerated. And failure was mentioned before. Failure is tolerated, maybe it's even encouraged. It's fine to fail. I think that's really important. Otherwise, people won't chase the big idea, chase the big project. You know, really, the big idea will not be chased if people are afraid of failure. Uh, in order to, to get the big ideas, you also need to have an atmosphere where people can be free to debate. Be free to debate, be free to disagree. Uh, so I think having a culture of that, that, that encourages disagreement, debate, and tolerates failure is critical to innovation. Anu, you would like to add something? Yeah. Yes. So um, I think there are two, three things, and I think um, some of the points you already mentioned, but at least the way I look at when we are hiring people, uh, there are two, three things we do. We don't yet do the wine test, but, but what we do is uh, I definitely, one of the things uh, I ask them is what kind of books they read. If they tell me they read Chetan Bhagat like type of books, then I usually don't hire them. <laughs> um, What's wrong with Chetan Bhagat? Okay, we'll get there. Uh, <laughs> the second thing is to the ask morning. them what kind of, um, you know, what kind of other things they do other than, you know, genetics for sure they will know, right? But uh, if they don't understand that, I mean, if they, you know, do they play the violin, do they do something else? And just ask them about what they really enjoy the most. And I think, you know, those are people who are in general creative in, by nature. So I think one is to say, yes, I need deep domain expertise, but you also need people who enjoy life as it is, right? Because you want them to be able to sit with other people who have different interests and be able to create something that nobody else has done. And I think that for me, you know, is, is important, right? So the, that one of the things you'll find in our team would be that these guys are all very slightly crazy. And if you give them one, you know, we, we'll come up with campaigns which are, you know, based on completely different things other than what is genetics, but everything ultimately links back to genetics, right? So you are, um, you have to create that sort of a team, uh, and you have to constantly do it. You have to constantly be you know, creating that culture of fun and uh, innovation, but always remembering that what we are trying to do. The other thing we have done is we've also been very clear that you know, it's OK if a product doesn't do well. You know, we, will, we will get rid of it. And uh, that we have done. We have done both in my previous company and this company. And we said it is OK. You know, it is just that the market is not ready or whatever. We have, have done something wrong. But we will use this expertise in, in something else. So don't worry about it. So I think those are a few things that we do internally. And I think that keeps the, you know, everybody motivated to be able to get something to the next level. Because I think pessimism can sometimes be a deterrent. So we do have a few people like that because you need a little bit of uh, Controversy within that. Within I think the, the, the team is The point you raised, the question you raised about innovation, large companies is very important because even today, large companies often are very big, you know, sources of innovation. And in general, the, you know, what a lot of theory says is that innovation also is a mindset, is a habit. You have to actually have some cultures that, you know, you just to become fit, you have to have. You got to go to the gym regularly. You have to eat well. Similar kind of ideas about experimentation, about taking risks, about all the kind of innovative habits that we mentioned earlier. Now, we're running out of time, so it's 5.27, and we only have three or three minutes left. So maybe I'll request uh, 
five panel members, just to give very, very short, you know, just a one sentence thought or just a takeaway point or a phrase that you'd like to leave the audience with. So, Arun, do you just have, I'm sorry to put you on the spot first, but do you have any? Yes, and I, I, mine's actually philosophical because you have just taken us into new realms of thought here. But um, I think we need the issue is to have teams that can enjoy working together and accomplish a lot. And also have people who are obsessive about trying to do something different in you. And, and that's a challenge for large organizations. How do we make that happen together? Nicholas? Um, I guess uh, the challenge I would pose to the audience would be if you look at yourself in the mirror and you're asking whether or not you know, you're giving up or you're giving back enough in your community, um, in your family, the answer would probably be no. You could do more. And so if you want to uh, inspire people to change the way they think, um, work with them and coach them and provide mentorship and, and share advice. Uh, I think it's an incredibly powerful tool. You'll find that it keeps you pretty connected to some different perspectives as well. Um, I mentor enormous amounts of entrepreneurs, and uh, I learn every single day because of that. And uh, it's one of the things that, that keeps me, uh, I'm, I'm young, I'm 32, but it keeps me even younger because I work with a lot of uh, kids that are coming out of high school, and they're choosing not to go to university because they've been learning how to do uh, coding at night, and uh, those are the kind of kids that I'm super interested in seeing work because they work collaboratively, they're contributing to open source projects, they know uh, that if they continue on this path, they can have sovereignty over their time. It's really interesting. Um, so I, I like surrounding myself with those kinds of people, but in short, I think a healthy balance between uh, a risk appetite and some pessimism, but entrepreneurs also have an unlimited amount of optimism for certain things. and. Uh, that's one of the things that I deeply enjoy about being around entrepreneurs. So I, I think that there, there's a lot of opportunity um, in India. It, it's, it just needs to start getting unlocked. And uh, you have incredible talents. Um, talent is distributed everywhere. Um, sometimes opportunity isn't. But it's just about sometimes just letting somebody know that it's OK. And that then they'll go pursue that opportunity. So that's, those are my closing thoughts. I know. Yeah, I think you know uh, there are enough people who do you know you know innovative things. Uh, I think what we need to do is to uh, stop looking at you know what we can't do and look at what we can do and figure out how we will do it. And that's that's definitely one thing. The other thing is I would say that you know start at home, make sure that you know uh, what we practice, what we preach, we also practice. Uh, you know whether it is saying that you know we will allow our kids to. Uh, to become what, who they are. So like my parents did for me, we would argue about any small things, uh, read a lot of books, and I think that's the way we will get an innovative culture across. And if everybody does that, little by little, I don't see why we should not be optimistic about the future. Sandeep? I'm an eternal bull on India. And I voted with my feet coming back 10 years ago, and I continue to believe in, in what we can achieve here in India. So let me just state that out up front. Uh, India is a billion people, and any person you talk, any Indian you talk to has fantastic ideas. So we are great at ideation. But when it comes to putting it together and executing, we don't have the right ecosystem, we don't have the right universities, R&D, mentor setups, and the giving that uh, Dhiraj was talking about to really take that idea and bring it to, bring it to a, product or a, a product or a service. And I think each one of us can help in a small way to really create that ecosystem for entrepreneurs to really prosper. And the last closing statement I would make is, uh, you know, the, on, on the gender diversity side, we have really left out 50% of the contribution that our population can do, which is backing really women entrepreneurs. And I backed a woman entrepreneur five years ago in a fashion business, which is today the largest fashion house coming out of India. And every board meeting I sit in, every interaction I have, I just walk away thinking, wow, this company is run so differently than all of my other companies. And the more women entrepreneurs we can back, we will just see the entire rubric of our country change and the thinking change and the way companies scale and the, and the kind of uh, tenderness with which you can build scalable companies while creating a difference is, is just immense. So really focusing on women entrepreneurs and figuring out a way to really nurture them and help them scale companies would just stay, change India in a big way. Leerich? I feel um, that, uh, you know, we need organi organizations that get excited about uncertainty. And, uh, and if, if that's the case, then the people there 
and the organizations themselves cannot be thinking of innovation from a center perspective right if the it has to be omnipresent uh, you don't have a center for honesty you know every other place is dishonest this place will be honest but in many places you have a center of innovation and stuff like that you know so that omnipresence uh, is going to be very very important and that's going to happen if these organizations are not knowledge oriented they have to be learning oriented what you know is not what is important but what you can learn is what is more important and learning is d by dt of knowledge the rate of change of knowledge when knowledge dies learning happens if you want to be learning oriented then you have to be an eternal child and curious and that curiosity dies when you have an expert mindset <laughs> you have to be experimentation oriented you cannot be expert oriented so you cannot hire for roles and responsibilities you cannot hire for these kind of things and you have to do that not as a 30 people company you have to do that as a 3000 people company do you have the pardon my french balls to do that as a 3000 people company you know that's going to be very 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 important and that world the new ip is not being secretive intellectual property my property if you think like that you are not a giver network you are not a giver ecosystem the new ip is interdisciplinary perspective which is connecting various things connecting subjects connecting people you know working as teams copying nicely giving credit to other companies uh, you know working across different things i think that ecosystem uh, is what we need to be thinking about that's what i'd like to see and well, and being a bull about something doesn't mean you don't call the bullshit you know right so that's very important right. and we call the bullshit while being bull well that's hard one to beat so <laughs> i think i think on that note let me invite you to just thank all the panelists excellent in our session and uh, i hope you took some ideas from it and hope you enjoyed the celebrate the sparks of innovation within yourself and the people around you thank you so much